Welcome to Disability Empowerment Now, Season 4. I'm your host, Keith Mavidikinsini. Today I'm talking to John McFarland, the founder of the Popsicle Organization. John, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be with you. So let's start off with the vital work that your organization does. You were telling me about it uh, before we started the episode. Okay. Popsicle. uh uh-huh is an acronym for the Post-Polio Syndrome Center for Learning Excellence. There's an awful lot of people around who've had polio, polio survivors, as they prefer to be called, who are running up against problems and they cannot find anybody who knows how to deal with polio. In most countries, polio... Uh, and in the in the states especially, polio has been eradicated for fifty years. Yeah, something, something of, like something of that order. Uh, in Europe, it's been uh, polio free for uh, forty five years, but there are still organisations and there are still cases of wild polio occurring around the world, especially in places like. Afghanistan and Pakistan, and there are also, unfortunately, cases of polio which occur through circulating vaccine-derived polio. Now, most most people of my age, rather rather of more elderly years than you, Keith, uh, are in a situation where um, we used to get our a polio vaccine on a a tongue or on a sugar lump. Now, if they they are still used in certain places, and if those vaccines are not kept properly at the right temperature and the right storage conditions, they can actually mutate and cause polio itself. But... Uh wrong phrase to use, but that's a fascinating fact that you just said uh, that the vaccine can mutate under certain conditions and actually cause the uh, syndrome or or disease that it was created to prevent. Correct. And uh, that, that, that leads into a whole other area of problems, not just with polio, but with various other I won't say vaccines, but various other ways of doing things. Because you've got to be in a situation where you can keep these uh, vaccines in the correct storage areas. Yeah. And it, it, it goes through, you know, Popsicle is one area. That's my own organization. But then I work on with others that I'm I've been working with for some years now like the post-polio syndrome advocacy group. Now that is, it's not Rotary, but it's linked to Rotary International loosely because quite a few of us who are in it are in Rotary. And that is a worldwide organization. Now when I mean worldwide, it gets really awkward. On some days we are having discussions where the furthest west is Hawaii, and the furthest east that we've got on the same link is New Zealand. 
Unfortunately, there is a thing called the international date line that goes in between the two. So we can land up with very awkward conversations like I had the other night when I was, um, I didn't put the camera on. Nobody would want to see me at this time in the morning. It was 2 a.m. and we were having conversations and, and, and doing those sorts of things. I'm also involved with Rotary International's World Disability Advocacy, which is looking at all areas of disability around the world for all sorts of people without fear or favour. So I found you through LinkedIn and it said you were an actor. A little background on me, I'm also a actor. And as you can tell by my lad's name, half of it, I better be Irish, uh, or there's something wrong uh, with my lad's name. My family uh, line actually descends uh, from Donegal, uh, and so I'm... Uh, very taken with my ancestral homeland, uh, and particularly the advocacy and acting over there. As you well know, the theater in Ireland is world-renowned. How did you first you bitten, so to speak, by the acting bug. And what propelled you into acting professionally? Very simple. It was one of those things where you land up and you have an opportunity which opens up which allows you to express your opinions and your views in a public fora or forum. Uh, and I, as you can tell from my accent, I'm certainly not Irish. Uh, I, I, I was born in Scotland, brought up, uh, I won't say in the, U, in the UK, uh, peripatetic. I grew up in Hong Kong, Japan, Kenya, uh, Washington, D.C., all over the place. Wow. So I, I'm I, sorry for uh, identifying you as Irish. Uh, that's uh, incredible, but uh, 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 incredible error on my part. I hope you will forgive me that uh, error. Please continue with your history. No, no forgiveness required, Keith. Um, I'm, I'm literally, I'm peripatetic. Uh, I have never, I have never stayed in one place for very long. I um, give you an example. Of when I got married more years ago than my wife would care to remember, um, I'm, I'm now in a. Uh, we moved 18 months in the first three, and we've moved three times in the first 18 months we were married. So we've we've lived all over the place. How do I? Let me ask I, you: Is there any place on the planet that you haven't at least driven to, flown over? Or lived in because you sound very much like a worldwide traveler. Um, the only place I've not been is down into Antarctica. Um, the um, the you know I've I've literally lived on every continent apart from Antarctica, uh, as has my wife. Okay, um, fair enough. <laughs> I. I worked, I worked for a major organization. I landed up as their um, executive director. 
and went on from there until my polio took over on me, you know, the post-polio syndrome. Um, but, you know, it, do, it doesn't matter where you go or what you do. Life is for the living. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and people don't realize that enough. Uh, they they have a tendency Absolutely to right. Yeah, they have a tendency to go back and say, well, and they always with a lot of all with a lot of people with a lot of, sort of disabilities, they're always looking backwards over their shoulder. I'm afraid I have the opposite point of view. I look forwards. Yeah. Um, so life tell is me what is it like? to act with a disability or did the polio prevent you from acting and you got into advocacy instead or were you able to do both for a time? I was able to do both. These days I'm Unfortunately, my disability is getting worse. I've got uh, an increasing neurological divergence and uh, uh, degeneration. But at the end of the day, I have only one thing that I work on is, um, all right, my carapace, if you would like to use that long word, is, um, is breaking down. But the one thing I is that still works, unfortunately for some, is the grey cells. So I'm still working on the basis of uh, it doesn't matter as long as I can get the help that I require to do what I need to do physically. My brain is active, and if I did nothing else in life, I would want to keep that active. Um, I'm I'm not sure if you actually know this one Keith but um, some people turn around and go wow what I'm 76 now and I'm still intending to be carrying on as long as I can carry on I will carry on I will carry on acting and I I do things with radio in Ireland and the, with the BBC I also I also will carry on acting on behalf of people and working as an advocate for them. Um, I cannot, there are so many people who do not have a voice. They do, and, and unfortunately, they don't know how to get a voice either. Uh, one of the things that I want to do over the years is to empower people give them what they need to be able to work and to be able to have their voice so they can speak for themselves and not be disregarded or disrespected. So much of what you just said is so true. Uh, and it, it's difficult to figure out where to go uh, from what you just said, because all of it is from keeping your mind active to advocating for those who unfortunately don't have a voice and are very often overlooked by society at large. My, my dad just turned 90, and he is still sharp as tack with little variations here or there. Uh, and my mother is quite a bit younger, uh, but She's also very active. Uh, and I think that's great. Uh, it, it helps keep you alive, keep you engaged in this 
great adventure called Life. Uh, and so so what would you take me back to what it was like when you first found out you had polio and what it was like adapting to that knowledge and then when the syndrome uh, came what would you like adjusting to your new normal and had the progression been slow? Had it been moderate? Had it, what is it like to have polio? Well, most, most people these days in modern society don't know what polio means. It used yes, to be called infant exactly paralysis. exactly why I'm asking the question. Right. Well, it's a virus, and it's a gastroenteritic virus, which means that it goes in one end, and without being too impolite, goes out the other. Uh, but for in in certain number of cases... It crosses the uh, gut blood wall and it goes in and attacks what's called the anterior horns on the spine. And it paralyzes not the nerves which you feel, but the, the nerves which make you move away. So if somebody's stuck a, uh, a candle under my foot, I could feel it and it would burn, but I would not be able to move my my leg out the way. I am totally paralyzed from just below my diaphragm, right the way down, and partial paralysis in my right arm, as you might be able to see from my hand. Um, so what was it like? Uh, growing up, you got on with life. You, uh, I, I, cu I couldn't kick a football, a, a soccer ball, as you would call it, over your yeah. side. Um, but I could use my crutches to, to 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 kick it around. And occasionally, if I was playing football and somebody got in my way and I went to tackle them, it was my crutches which tackled them, which got rid of them. Um, but the, 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 you know, it, it just went on. I just took life day by day. Um, you, you have to... You have to meet life as it meets you. Um, there is no point in, as I was saying earlier, looking backwards. Oh, yes, these days they turn around with polio and they say, if we'd known what we know now, if you hadn't exercised so hard, if you hadn't done this, you hadn't done that, uh, you would not be in the situation that you are now. I've only got one comment to make. Uh, I wouldn't change one iota of what's happened in my life. Uh, That's I have had... very profound. Uh, how did you come to that realization? Well, were you as a child, did you adopt the modality of always looking forward, never back. Always forward, always forward. I'll, I'm, I'm going to give you one thing which you may not realize, and a lot of people do not realize, is that if it hadn't been for polio, modern intensive care, intensive therapy units would not exist today. Wow. Now, if you if if you go if you go back to 1952, there was an outbreak of polio in Copenhagen, and uh, 
the outbreak of polio was so severe that the mortality rate was 89%. Now you are talking about, you are talking about very, very bad things. But through um, fortunate effects, people being around, some of whom were American, others were Danish, they came up with a method of actually uh, treating polio cases. Iron lungs were far and far, far few. There wasn't much around. So what they actually did is they had medical students and dental students having putting a mask over the patient's face and hand pumping them until they got enough power back in their chest to be able to get a, a certain amount of respiration. And the way the the, uh, the regime they came up with is actually the regime which is the modern way of indeed of dealing with intensive care, which is looking after the patient right away from the outset and dealing with it. And ICUs, ITUs, as they're called in other parts of the world, wouldn't exist without them. I've I am not disappearing. I've just forgotten the name of it. A Dr. Mm. Hannah Wunsch, who is uh, now in New York and is actually lecturing there, but was in Toronto, wrote a book. I forgot the name of the book has just gone out of my head. And it's called Autumn Ghost. And the reason it's called Autumn Ghost is that in uh, Northern Europe, polio was prevalent in the fall, autumn of each year. Whereas if you read books like uh, Nemesis by Philip Roth, uh, yeah. it, was it was prevalent in North America in the summer. But, you know, she... Hannah Wunsch has written this, written this book, and it actually, I asked her to come on to a group and talk to a global audience of polio survivors. And she said, well, what am I going to be able to tell them? I'm only going to tell them what happened. I said, you're going to turn it on its head, Hannah. You're going to tell them that if it hadn't been for them, thousands, millions of other people would not have survived because they would not have developed the intensive care facilities and yeah. therapies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, there's so much truth to... It's just a staggering number to try to compute. Uh, that would not be here without intensive care. Uh, I spent three months of my life at the very beginning because I was premature in the NICU, natal, natal intensive care unit uh, here in America. I find it, again, I don't mean to uh, water down a uh, polio, but I find it fascinating hearing about your experience with polio because across the pond, as you said, most Americans don't know what polio is. They think it's eradicated completely because of a vaccine 50 years ago or something like that. But it's very much still prevalent. Uh, maybe not as 
as prevalent, but it's still around. It's it's not gone. It's it's not gone. If you go back to 1988, there were 388,000 cases of paralytic polio. Now, if you if you if you if you like to sit down with your calculator, you can work it out. That means that at least uh, two hundred times more than that had actually had the polio virus at some stage, although it hadn't affected them. But we're now down to a case this year. We've got about forty cases of wild polio right the way around the world, um, mostly in the Pakistan, Afghanistan regions, but take it right the way through to the other side of it. There are still somewhere in the region of 18 to 20 million polio survivors in the world. Yeah, it's an, I saw your reaction. It's an enormous number. Most of these people, uh, I won't say exist, um, that would be that would be a demeaning word. They live in sub-Saharan Africa and in the Indian subcontinent, um, and they are they are still there. They are still requiring help, and there is awful lot of help that's not being given. Now, it's it's not it just doesn't um, occur with 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 polio. Um, it occurs with all sorts of things. You've got people with, uh, how, you've got people with ALS, uh, as you call it in in the states, uh, MND, motor neurone disease over here. It's the same. It's the same thing. You've got various other uh, neurological conditions. You've got other people who are fighting for their rights. Um, you have loads of people around the world who have cerebral palsy yeah. and they are they are in a situation where because they have a tick or they can't work in the same way they are marginalized yes you i have cerebral palsy myself i don't know if you can tell by the accent uh, but it, it's as it as it so happens in my house at the moment is one of my lifelong friends who I met when she was nine and her son is CP. Um, she's over visiting me from England at the moment. Nice. Um, nice. But, you know, I, I've, I've seen firsthand what happens. I've seen how it works. I've also seen with other children who've got downs. Yeah. I've, I've seen other, I've seen other kids with other, neurodivergent problems, autism, um, yeah. you know, uh, ADHD, all yeah. those sorts. Of and I'm working with all of those groups as well through the Rotary um, Club of World Disability Advocacy. We are getting calls for help every single day from around the world, heartbreaking calls. And you 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 get you get um you know you get small successes as one of my colleagues did. She had a case which got referred back to her from Central Africa from a lady who had severe uh, physical problems through birth defect, and uh, she was cooking on a little wooden stove. She had a little gas lamp in a house and she could afford about one telephone call on the internet a month and she wanted and she reached out and she wanted to know what was going on what could be done we picked up the cry for help or one of my colleagues did in quebec and she was able to talk to her put her in touch with somebody in her locality helped her out and she is now in better housing she's got better living conditions and everything else i don't call people people say to me oh you're a polio survivor 
I, and I say, yeah, okay, I'm I'm one of those, but I'm actually part of the polio family. It's a family around the world. Disability is a family. You have probably faced the similar sorts of challenges in acceptance and in being able to do things at school or later on in life as I have. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we 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 all have the same things. We are all part of a great big melting pot. We're right, there may be, according to the WHO latest stats, there may be one billion people who have got um, some form of disability around the world. Every single person around the world has got a disability in one way or another, whether it be physical, mental, or attitudinal. Yeah. And, well, there's... So what are the top things that you wish that people knew about polio and people who live with polio because again a lot of people think it's no longer present uh and it it very much is it's just less present than it used to be, but it's very much still around, and there are survivors who live with it. What do you hope that people take away from knowing more about polio and the legends of the vaccine and how it has evolved, the treatment, and what do you hope that people take away from everything we've talked about in terms of understanding polio and its very real effects on today? I think let's let's take polio out of the equation because okay. polio is, polio is uh, a disease. It's still it's in fact it's the it's the only disease which is classified by the World Health Organization in its international classification of diseases in three different areas. Uh, one is the, um, the first one that you get, the acute, and there's what's called polio sequelae, and then there's what you call um, uh, late effects of polio, post-polio syndrome, uh, or polio muscular atrophy, whichever way you like to put it. There's all these sort of comments. Um, a, long number, a long number of years ago, Bill Gates uh, and... Uh, put a lot of money in with Rotary in trying to eradicate polio as the second disease in the world which would be totally eradicated. The first being uh, smallpox uh, with Jenner. And uh, Jenner is the man who started off the whole vaccine thing uh, with getting rid of, uh, with, with finding out that uh, uh, milkmaids who used to get cowpox, um, believe it or not, from milking cows, never got smallpox. And when they found out that, they were able to uh, isolate bits and pieces and inoculate people against smallpox. And that's how the first one disappeared. Second one may be uh, polio, although it's going to be a long, hard fight still. Um, but if you take polio out of the equation, you've got to look at it as a complete thing about what is disability? How is disability viewed? Disability is not something to be scared of. The days of people uh, when you were in a uh, using your wheelchair 
and you were going down the street and they and they drag their kids across the road because they're not nice. You know, you don't look at those, don't look at those sorts of things. Um, and you go on from those. Those are thankfully disappearing yeah. in large proportions. Certainly, certainly in um, North America, um, large hunks of South America, not so much in the Central African belt and in parts of India because there are cultural differences. And you also have to look at culture with disability because in many cases, if a woman gives birth to a disabled child, she is the one who is defective and has uh, a fear of the gods and has done something wrong or has created sin. And you've got you've got other other attitudes of ableism as well. And you've also got the the hor horrific circumstances um, which occurs in certain parts of Africa, where those people who get the pigmentation they lose pigmentation for their black skin. Um, they are looked at as uh, that is a way to stop myself from becoming disabled or anything else. And they are actually killed and in certain places eaten. Uh, you know, you've got you've got it's down it's down to that. You've also got you've also got the situation in certain of the um, established churches even in, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to mention churches by name because uh, we will get into all sorts of ethical discussions. Yeah. But you, you've got you've got situations where uh, if a, a child is born and maybe in a certain culture, it is not the child who is the problem; it is the parents who have sinned. Yeah. But you've also, you've also got the thing that then. Uh, because the child has a disability, they are then hidden away. And that happens so many times around the world. And I see it all the time, even in Europe, even in North America. What have I learned over the years? Well, the one thing I've learned for a starter is stop looking over your shoulder. You can't rectify what's happened in the past. You've got to look forward. Learn and live. Live for today and work on the basis of its quality of life. Now, there are many people who have got debilitating diseases, ALS, MND, various others, and they are turning around and they are saying, it's not quantity, it's quality. Yeah. Now, and it, it, it's very true. Something which you won't be aware of probably on over your side is that there was, uh, we have a, a game over in England called rugby league football. Um, it's, it's played with a, a ball the same as you would use for soccer, so you can do torpedo throws and everything else. There was a little guy who played number seven. He was five foot two. His name was Rob Burrows. He developed MND, ALS. Yeah. He took it head on. The worst part of it, to some extent, was that his wife was a trained physical physiotherapist, physical therapist, who was dealing with people like this all her all her professional life, and she had to watch her husband come down with it. Everybody rallied around him, and by his attitude of life, and with the help of his teammates, he raised before he died over fifty million pounds for research in three years. He took wow. on the attitude of life is for living. I will do what I can to live the best life I can and to help others live the best life they can. Wow. That, that's incredible. And certainly uh, 
like well lived in a life of servants and it, it it's extraordinary learning a lot from you about how to live life because you're right it's for living you should work forward not backwards I like to think that both advocates with disabilities and those who have yet to discover or embrace their own disabilities, listen and watch this program. I'm not naive to think that everyone takes away the same things from episodes as everyone else does. So as my guests, what do you hope that advocates on the other side of the pond, as you would say, take away from this episode? And what do you hope that those who have yet to become disabled themselves take away from the episode. Life is precious. It's very precious. As an advocate, I would like to think that people will be able to learn how to speak up for themselves. Um, People with disabilities are not to be talked down to. They are to be treated as an equal. And when they are treated as an equal, they will be in a situation where they can demonstrate to others who perhaps may be more physically or intellectually uh, able in some respects, uh, that they have a lot to learn themselves. We all have a great deal to learn. The biggest, le the biggest experience we've all got is how to treat each other as equals and how that we can show others how we can live and how we can actually enhance the lives of others by precept and example. John, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day or night or evening, whatever, uh, <laughs> to have this conversation with me. I've enjoyed it immensely. I've learned a ton about... Uh, Polio, but more important, your mindset, your forward thinking attitude, and the vital advocacy you do through the popsicle organization. If anyone wants to find out more about the vital work that the Popsicle organization does, how would they be able to do that? The best way to look at it is not to look at the Popsicle organization, which is actually very clinically um, focused, um, because there are many doctors who do not understand how to treat old polio cases. But if they want to find out more about polio and advocacy for polio you go to ppsadvocacy at gmail.com and if you want to actually look at the whole area of advocacy for disabled persons you go to rotarywda at gmail.com and if i can get a plug in because uh we are of a certain generation or I'm, shall we say, a slightly more elderly generation than yourself. Um, we are holding on the 26th of October 
a worldwide summit on inclusive education for children with disabilities. Children are our future. Children with disabilities are our future. And we are looking at running a world, well, we are not looking at, we are running a worldwide webinar and uh, situation for inclusive education for children with disabilities around the world. And you can get further details of that at Rotary, uh, Rot uh, Rotary Club of World Disability Advocacy on Facebook. And you can register for free. And you will, I will tell you, there, there is one lady who is our keynote speaker. Uh, she is a brilliant advocate and shows you what can be done. She is deaf, she is blind, and she graduated from Harvard Law School. That says it all. John, it's been such a pleasure to get to know you. I felt like we could talk for another hour or two. I hope... I hope you know you can always reach out and come back on this program. I hope you continue your vital work and know that you've made a difference through your life. Thank you for the opportunity, Keith. You know where I am as well. It works the other way around. Um, we can we can all just do our own little bit to help others in this world. And if we can do no more than that, we will have achieved a great deal in life. Very well said, my friend. I hope you have a great week ahead of you. And you too. Talk to you soon. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye.